Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Uh, in 2017, a rising tech entrepreneur and a once successful rapper banded together to create the gram greatest calamity in music festival history, save for Altamont, probably. In the new documentary, Fire, documentary filmmaker Chris Smith burrows underneath the surface of the tweets and headlines to depict what was, for some, a tragedy and for others, a premeditated con job. Let's take a look. All these models, like, in the Bahamas. The most insane festival the world has ever seen. Island getaway turned disaster. It became very barbaric. Right now, we are the fucking laughing stock of everything. Just wait until you see what you're getting yourselves into. American rapper Ja Rule is in the Bahamas with his business partner. Billy McFarlane is an amazing entrepreneur. He can convince anyone of pretty much anything. They just bought an island. Pablo Escobar's island. Oh my gosh. Ding! We're gonna throw a festival, yeah. Within 48 hours, they sold out. These guys are either completely full of shit or they're the smartest guys in the room. We were working around the clock, no sleep. Billy's like, bring more workers. We need more workers. Every single day, guys, more tense. He just would not take no for an answer. And he just kept pulling money in somehow. Desperate people do desperate things. He was lying to investors and making it seem like we were making a ton of money when we weren't. I mean, that's fraud. We need to get the messaging out now that this is not a luxury music festival. Oh my God. There's mattresses all over the place getting soaked. The save yourself mode kicked in. All right, it's a free for all. It became this looting mentality. There's an angry mob, they're pissed off and they want their money. Powerful models built this festival. And then one picture of cheese on toast ripped down the festival. They just couldn't physically fit that many people on the island. The event's co-founder is facing up to 20 years in prison. Oh! If you had thousands of dollars to go on a trip to see Blink-182, that's on you. That is Darwinism at its finest. <laughs> It'll be the biggest event in a decade, I promise you. I'll be there. Everybody, please welcome Seth Cosno, Gabriel Bluestone, and the great Chris Smith. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, congratulations on the film. I'm so happy to have you on this stage. As I told you backstage, you're, uh, you're one of my favorite filmmakers. Thank you. Uh, this story, your approach to it, I think, is completely different than everybody else's approach, just in terms of how we talk about the Fire Festival. Most of the time when we talk about it, we make fun of it. We make fun of the creator, and we make fun of the people who went. Sorry, Seth. <laughs> uh, but you, you take a much more human approach. I still think it's quite funny. At times, but where where did that come from? When and when 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 you started making this, did you think to yourself, okay, well, this is about let's make this about the people and about the people who are actually hurt by it? Yeah, I think I think a lot of people were aware of fire just from the headline, and so to me that was the part that everyone knew. So I was interested in trying to see what was behind the headline and who were the people that were on you know on the front lines of trying to put this together and sort of what was their story. And it wasn't something that you knew was going to work, but it was something that I was interested in trying to, to uncover. You know, I think looking back at your films, you've always been interested or fascinated in like a singular person who has a dream or has a, um, a well, an American dream, if you will, or has very big ideas about culture and about the world. And um, were you fascinated by Billy? Were you fascinated by this sort of like preternaturally American con artist? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, he, he's... Um He's very enigmatic, and he, and I think what makes him such a great subject, you know, I think why there's so much attention on him is just because he was so complicated. He was so hard to figure out. You couldn't fully understand the decisions that he was making at every turn. Um, and ultimately, I think that's like, you know, the film ends up being a character study. Yeah, absolutely. It's a character study through the eyes of everybody that was around him, that worked with him, and the footage. Were you shocked by the footage that you saw of of him and Ja Rule kind of like, not really getting anything together on this island and instead partying? Well, I mean, that was during the model shoot, so that was sort of a different... There were different phases, you know, and, and that was, you know... That was actually 
despite how crazy the experience of making the promotional video was, it was an incredible success. You know, they, they, they proved that they were incredible marketers. You know, they came up with this idea and this vision and they promoted it and it, and it did appeal to a huge amount of people and it did, did sell out. So in that way, that was successful. The problem was that they, they hadn't figured out the logistics. So when, the, when that started, you start to see the wheels come off. Well, that, I mean, saying that they're incredible marketers is pretty spot on. Gabriel, do you think that this is Billy and, and, and Ja Rule and the whole Fire Festival is really uh, symptomatic of a culture of marketing, a culture of one that is solely based off of being able to market yourself and market your idea and come up with the logistics and the details later? Um, well, definitely. I think that's a huge aspect of <coughs> sorry, uh, startup cu culture, but also in terms of why it succeeded uh, and in terms of like the image of ourselves that we're trying to put forth, I think primarily on Instagram, especially within my generation, like it really tapped into that idea that, you know, if you can take a picture of yourself doing this, then you're part of that that group that you've been following. And I think they really tapped into that FOMO kind of culture. Um, and that's why it was it. The, the pre-sales, the sale part of it was a success. Um, when did you, as a, as a journalist, start to sort of notice or recognize that things were not right with fire? Um, it was kind of from the start. You know, you saw this incredible um, trailer and promotions for it, but then when you actually went to their website or tried to, you know, click through to the details, um, the, rep the website always read kind of like a, a first draft of like, you know, what a business school student might do as like a project. Like, like it, it had the idea of a, of a festival, but um, the, the descriptions didn't make sense. They changed over time. If you looked up the island, like you would see that the number of people that they were claiming they were inviting, like, like they didn't have a runway for a plane that was big enough to get that many people. And like, it just wasn't feasible and the details didn't add up. Um, and for something that looked so good, you know, it seemed too good to be true. It became very clear that it was that it, that it was. Um, Seth, you were there. Yes. Uh, as soon as you got there, was it pretty obvious that this thing wasn't going to work out? Yeah, I mean, upon getting to the actual site itself, I mean, you saw just uh, everything you, you saw in the film: just uh, trucks, people, eighteen wheelers cargo containers and tents everywhere, mattresses, Amazon boxes, and you thought, you know, this is not anywhere near ready. You know, this is at least you know, months away from being ready. And were you set up for a villa, or were you set up for a FEMA tent? <laughs> we, we had purchased the, uh, I think, a lodge package, but then when we checked in, they gave us this villa tag, and so I thought, well, maybe we got upgraded to a villa. Great, you know? <laughs> And it so, just didn't mean anything, so you yeah. just give a tag. Yeah, the luggage tag just said Villa on it. I was like, is there a, another part of this tag that I need to keep so you can give me, like, do you know how this works? Yeah. But, um, it, you know, so uh, it said Villa on it, and uh, the, the whole thing was obviously, you know, the villas were off in another section, but we, yeah, we knew right away that this is not what what we signed up for. Was it pandemonium right away, or did it did it slowly build into that? I think it slowly built into that, because everyone just got dropped off at that blue house, and you saw those lines of people, and people were trying to check in, and we were just kind of standing around thinking, all right, maybe there's a section where the lodges are, or, or the tents are, you know. We had no direction, and, and the funny part in the film is where the Billy keeps telling the guy to turn the music up, and I just kept thinking, why doesn't someone go on stage and grab the microphone and you know tell people where to go, like take some direction? But um, but yeah, it, once it kind of Billy said go go grab a tent, it was sort of a free for all, and then as it got darker, it got kind of more out of hand. So yeah, the turn the music up part of the documentary is terrifying. It's like he's Guantanamoing everybody, <laughs> just like cranking up music as loud as possible for a bunch of scared, confused people. Uh, Chris, the, the your body of work is, is fascinating because I feel like you start as a pretty much a verite filmmaker, not to yeah. not to define it or to yeah. box you in in any way. And you've recent as of recently with Jim and Andy and with this turned into a, a filmmaker who does really well with found footage. Yeah. Um, was that something that you that you wanted to do that you saw coming, or do you really see them as sort of the same? You're just telling a story, no matter what you have. I mean, ultimately, you're just telling a story, and you're trying to find things that are interesting. And whether you're capturing it in the moment or you're looking back, it, it's it just depends on the situation. This obviously, I wasn't there, so this was you know a big part of this movie was it was an archaeological project. You know, I worked with the the producer Mick Perzicki, and between the two of us, it was. 
just this constant search for footage, you know, and like trying to find yeah, Twitter and Instagram and everywhere. Any way that you could stuff. imagine. So there was, you know, they had a lot. Um, they Mick connected with a, this company called Matt Projects and they had a bunch of footage. And so it was really just piecing together all these different elements to try to get to allow the audience to go on a journey of what it was really like um, to be on the ground for fire from beginning to end. And to sort of be embedded with the people who believed that they could put this on or who believed everything that Billy told them. I mean, I, I think, yes, they, they were enlisted and they tried to fulfill their role as best they could. And at that point, you know, when you, when you take a commitment on like that, I, I think the problem was that they didn't know that there were so many things fundamentally that w just w weren't stable. And so these things were being revealed over time. So I don't think anyone really had the full picture until it got closer and closer to falling apart. Uh, and we reveal that sort of Billy has always been a person that has done that, right? He's always been someone who has built up an idea, and then as it's falling apart, fall, started to fall apart, he's built up and it, built it up another way. I mean, he's he's he was I think 25 at the time, so I can't say he's always always a couple years. the thing. But yeah, I mean, he had done a company before this called Magnesis, which I mean, the one thing that Billy seemed very good at was identifying uh, opportunity within in his own sort of um, from his own experience. So he moves to New York and he doesn't know people and um, you know is trying to figure out how, who to where to go, what to do. And so he he realizes there's other people that would probably be having the same experience. So he creates this sort of clubhouse for that group, you know. And so then he tries to book Ja Rule for a party. And that's difficult, and they realize, oh, there's an opportunity to create a talent booking platform, which is, you know, the, the, the thing that was surprising to me is that I had no idea that there was an actual tech company at the base of FIRE, and that the festival was actually just uh, supposed to be an event to promote, you know, the app. Yeah. Uh, but even the, even the talent booking company, was there a legitimacy to that? I mean, I, I heard that idea, and I was kind of like, I don't think anybody's just going to, any celebrity or anybody's going to be like, oh, I got booked for a party, thanks, and is going to go. There's a reason that there are a lot of middlemen to sort of come in between there. Yeah, but I, I think if you, it's hard to say. It's If you look at the um, the caliber of talent, maybe there's, you know, there's an app I think someone told me about called Cameo or something where you can get people to do something for a certain amount of money or call someone on their birthday. So there's definitely seems like they're, there is a marketplace there uh, in some way. What's your take? Um, so from what I could tell in my reporting, uh, it was definitely in the nascent stages, and they definitely um, were not totally honest about all the talent that they had on the, on the platform. They used a lot of artists that weren't um, in any way related to it. I think they had claimed that they were booking Drake for things. Um, but I, I believe that prosecutors identified there was some, they were making some money, um, and they were booking some people. You know, you had Ja Rule's involvement. Um, but what became really clear over the course of reporting the story out was that a lot of it, I mean, most of it was a house of cards. Like Billy's previous company, Magnesis, um, was basically like a ticket broker company at that point. So he would offer really discounted tickets to events like Beyonce concerts or Adele or Hamilton, shows that people really wanted to go to but couldn't necessarily get tickets right away. And he was offering them at a really steep discount. And it turned out that he had been subsidizing it by using the Fire Media Amex card to purchase almost half a million dollars or more of tickets on the day of from you know resale sites like StubHub and Ticketmaster at like a much, a very marked up price. So he was losing a lot of money on it, but he was hiding that by putting the losses on Fire. Um, and so he was just kind of shuffling a lot of money around like that, it turned out. Well, it's just this idea that if you can maintain some kind of popularity and some sort of brand identity, you can just pile on the debt and the debt, and hopefully someday someone will buy, someone, a big company will come along and buy you and pay off all that debt. It's really the tech bro mentality, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like the, the modus operandi of a tech entrepreneur. Well, that's what makes this story so interesting, I think, is especially when you're watching it from the outside, it's like, where is that line between, you know, kind of a loose business plan and outright fraud? Um, and, and so that's what I found really interesting, going back and seeing the people that worked on the festival and seeing their accounts and kind of trying to piece that together. You know, one of the 
one of the most powerful parts of the documentary are the uh, the people from the Bahamas, from the island, who are working on, on, on the festival. So often we think about just the tech entrepreneur, the con man, or the people who are designing the website, but there were all of these caterers and all of these people who were working for the festival who were truly impacted financially uh, by this. Was that something that you were aware of when you started interviewing them, or did that come out in the interviews? I mean, we were, I think we suspected, you know, when everyone's, when the the festival collapsed and everyone just sort of took off, you assume that there was probably collateral damage in some way. Um, but it wasn't until starting getting into the interviews that you really got a sense of the scope of it all. And then it, and then really, once we went down to the Bahamas and actually talked to people on the ground is when you really started to find stories like Marianne, who you know had put a lot of her savings into funding uh, you know, her involvement, which was to provide meals for you know the staff. Um, and so, you know, that that was really, you know, challenging. It was just, it was difficult because you're, you're seeing uh, the real effect that this had on, on people. And in some cases, it was devastating. Is that is that maybe one of the moments that you realize, or I'm, I'm not, maybe you realize that prior to even starting to shoot, that the documentary had to go kind of beyond the snark and the, and the hilarity of a failed music festival and had to actually approach this very human heartbreaking side? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, ultimately, I just felt like it was, it was an, it, there was an easy film to be made of just like looking back and laughing at all of this. And I, I, to me, the challenge was trying to show, make something that was relatable, where you actually understood sort of how this happened um, from the people that lived it, and sort of then also see what the fallout was. And and you hear from event, um, some of the event uh, contractors that sort of just their reflection on it is really, to me, was really poignant and touching because they're talking about their responsibility in this whole thing and, and owning up to it, you know, but, but also putting it in a context that I think anyone could relate to and that you realize, you know, I think a lot of people originally were hesitant to talk um, and they hadn't talked because there was a negative stigma surrounding fire. And my hope with the film was to show that, like, they have nothing to be ashamed of. Like, they they killed themselves to try to pull this thing off, or, and many of them were involved in what they thought was a legitimate business. And so, you know, from the fire media people and, you know, um, a lot of the people on the ground, the contractors, that they were, you know, that they inherited this sort of disaster, especially the ones that came in six to eight weeks before. You know, there's a story, uh, in the, speaking of dedication, I don't want to give too much away because the documentary comes out on Friday, uh, but people will watch this interview hopefully after they watch the documentary and they're going to want some expansion on this uh, amazing story that is almost like the centerpiece, set piece of the film, which is um, someone is so dedicated they're willing to commit, um, to debase themselves sexually for the purpose of the festival. Um, and one of the things that the the, uh, the the subject says in the interviews, before he admits this, he says, this probably isn't going to go that far. I'm curious what you think he meant by that when he said that to the to you. And he's a smart, funny character, and he's a great storyteller. So I think it's just part of this delivery. But ultimately, you know, I think the, the point of that story was less the salacious nature of it, but was really more to show how insane things got and how crazy things got. And, like, when you're in the middle of something like this, and everyone's not sleeping, and there's this pressure to sort of deliver, and these guests are coming, that to me, that was, that story felt very emblematic of sort of how insane everything got. Did you try to interview Ja Rule for it? No, we didn't. We, you know, there was so much archival footage that we had come in, you know, that we had come across, so we felt like, you know, he felt very represented for the role that, that as far as we could tell, he played, which was really just sort of like a pitch, you know, helping promote the festival at the beginning. Um, so I, I got to get this out of the way because if people follow the news, I'm sure they have this question. But just yesterday, Hulu released a, I, you could say a competing documentary. Um, I would say both documentaries are fascinating to watch side by side because they're two very different filmmakers with, with very different takes on the story. Um, but uh, what was that like? You know, you have this movie coming out on Friday. It's your first movie since Jim and Andy, which was about what, two, two years ago, a year ago. Um, what is that like to see, you know, a, a competing network release a, <laughs> a movie about the same thing? I mean, it was, it, we were aware of the production. We were aware it was coming out. It was, you know, I mean, it was discussed and Netflix just felt like their reach is so great that it was just something not to worry about for us. So we started focusing more on like a global release. Just, you know, we're in an internet age where people talk about things online and people in countries everywhere will want to be part of that dialogue. And so for us, it was really important to go with Netflix because it gave us the ability to 
sort of foster that conversation. And one of the things was that um, the Hulu documentary actually interviews Billy, uh, Ma Billy, who you have said that you actually didn't really want to interview because he's essentially you're not really going to get much out of him, or you're not going to get the well, truth. We, we, you know, we were open to interviewing, and we had set up two on two different occasions to do an interview, um, and it was going to be an exchange for giving money back to people that you know had been defrauded. Um, but in the end, he he got an offer. You know, he told us he was offered two hundred fifty thousand dollars from the other project, and so he was like, "I'm taking that." <laughs> so he was gone. <laughs> but you, I mean, do you think that opened that liberated you as a filmmaker to not to not even have his involvement? Um, then you, you know, I I like wasn't too concerned. I you know, from everything everyone that we had talked about, you know, he felt like he wasn't trustworthy. So I was very uh, skeptical that um, you know that an interview would actually produce much. From him. Yeah, anything that he said, you're eventually going to have to have somebody else refute because he's most likely lying. Or corroborate, lying. yeah. Yeah, or corroborate. Um, so, you know, like you were essentially in a lot of ways making fun of the festival, I think, before you even got to go, right? Yeah, that's true. Right, because you had this sort of mock influencer account that kind of became in itself an influencer account. Yeah, I, I guess so. I started this account, William Needham Finley IV, as this sort of satirical, over-the-top kind of uh, wealthy kid in, in North Carolina. Um, and it just sort of played to a local audience. And then um, I thought it'd be funny to kind of look at the influencer angle. And so going to Fire Festival to become the most influential influencer and kind of just be on the island of influencers was sort of the, the joke. And then... Uh, when I got there, I just, just kind of turned into reporting what was happening. Uh, before you get to that, did you meet any influencers, though, on the way? Did they know who you were? Oh, of course not. I mean, I'm, you know, my audience is local. I had 5,000 followers, and it's all kind of inside jokes in, in Raleigh. And um, so it was funny that, uh, I don't know, I kind of got swept up in this, and this stuff went viral, and it's, you know, I don't really have that big of a following at all, so... When you started reporting on everything that was uh, happening there, I mean, essentially, we see in the documentary, like, on your way, you find out that Blink-182 is canceled, but maybe this thing can kind of still go, because who knows? When you got there and started reporting on it, did it feel like a snowball effect, like it just got more and more shocking? Yeah, I mean, each thing just was more and more ridiculous. First year, you see the site, it's not finished. You think, well, maybe there's another section that is ready or something, and they're still getting this together. And then you see the lines, and then Billy's on the table, and then it's the tent free-for-all, and then you're trying to find your luggage off the back of a shipping container in the dark, and then, you know, uh, someone's standing next to me, and uh, did you did you take a shower? Yeah, but don't... Don't open your mouth. The water's green. You know, it's just stuff like that. I'm like, where'd you even find a shower? You know, so. Was um, there a part of you as someone who would, had created an influencer account, a fake influencer account to make fun of this sort of the idea of social media influencers? Did you, was there a part of you that even though you were there and suffering through it, you felt vindicated that this festival built off of the like influencer marketing was a total sham and a failure? Well, I mean, I, I guess I didn't I didn't want it to fail. You know, I mean, you wanted it to to be this successful thing that you thought you were going on just because I wanted to see what the whole, you know, like, how does this world work? How do these people monetize their identities and their brands and them and their lives um, and just kind of, you know, talk about that? I think leading up to it, I would tweet it. Um, companies and be like, I'm going to go to Fire Festival. Um, please send me some some merchandise. I'm an influencer, <laughs> you know, because you just say I'm an influencer and you're an influencer. But uh, you need that actual following, like the real people who make a living off of this. And you have to have tens of thousands of followers to actually make this a full time job. So I don't necessarily think I, I wanted it to fail or I felt vindicated. It was just kind of like I just went into reporting mode to to just say this is what's going on and. Um, I don't know, maybe it is indicative of what Instagram versus reality is, is like. But You know, uh, looks like we have a question from um, Twitter. I think it's for you, Seth. They're asking, uh, when did you know that the New York VIP access emails were not what they seemed? Well, right off the bat, uh, I think <laughs> the first one I got was for Masters, uh, the, the golf tournament tickets. And um, my friends who had went to the festival said, did you guys get this? And so when, when all of us got it, I figured someone 
has access to the the email list for fire and uh a friend of mine actually does travel packages to the masters i sent it to him he's like this isn't real and so i jokingly replied and i said sure i'll take you know two or, or however many and they send me the prices and i'm like i'm an influencer i don't pay for things you know like just tongue in cheek and then they're like okay we'll get you some media credentials i'm like you don't get media <laughs> credentials to the masters so i knew immediately and the people selling vip packages don't get media <laughs> credentials yeah, for yeah. the thing yeah. so i knew right away that that wasn't wasn't real, but I still didn't know that it was Billy McFarlane behind it. You know, it was signed from someone else, and I just figured he sold the email list. Chris, what do you think it says about Billy that not only was he committing these acts of fraud, but he was, in the end, filming all of it? Like, he actually asks a, asks a camera crew to come film him, come up with fraudulent ideas. Yeah, I mean, that was when I mentioned earlier that what made him so fascinating was he was, you couldn't, I didn't understand everything that he was doing. And I think that, like, at the center of any great movie or interesting, you know, a great character is, you know, somebody that you're just still thinking about and is you're fascinated by just by their actions, which in this case didn't always fully make sense. Um, I have to let you guys go. I want to ask you, uh, as a fan of American movie, I'm curious if you are still in touch with, with, with Mark. I haven't seen them lately. It's, it's been a while. Uh, if people haven't seen it, after you watch Fire, find a way to watch an American movie. It's truly one of the one of the great American documentaries of all time. All right, um, congratulations on Fire. Uh, it's a story incredibly well told. I think it's going to go down in history. It's on Netflix this Friday. Everybody, give them a huge round of applause. Let's hear it. Thank you.